everyone, I'm Miss Mary Beth. I'm the Youth Services Librarian at Ingalls Memorial Library and Ridge. And I'm here today for Armchair Adventures. And that's our series where every day I read a little bit of a book to you, and eventually we finish a whole book together. And the book we're about to start today, for the first time, we're starting we're starting a new book. We're reading The Voyage Voyages of Doctor Dulu. And it's written by Hugh Lofting. And this one, the Newberry Award. And this book was is the second and the there are many books about Dr. Doolittle, and this one's the second. But I thought that this would be a fun one because our summer reading program theme is Imagine Your Story. And it's all about adventures and fun fantasy tales. and So I thought going on a voyage would be a pretty fun story to read about. Do you know who Dr. Doolittle is? He's pretty cool because he can talk to animals. So let's read this story and we're going to find out all about the adventures he goes on. And here's a picture of him. So let's see. The, this is the prologue. And our narrator is not Dr. Doolittle, but he's friends with Dr. Doolittle. All that I have written so far about Dr. Doolittle, I heard long after it happened from those who had known him. Indeed, a great deal of it took place before I was born. But now I come to set down that part of the great man's life which I saw myself and I took part in. Many years ago, the doctor gave me permission to do this, but we were both so busy that vo voyaging around the world, having adventures and filling notebooks full of natural history, that I never seemed to get the time to sit down and write of our doings. Now, of course, when I am quite an old man, my memory isn't so good anymore. But whenever I am in doubt and have to hesitate and think, I always ask Polynesia, the parrot. That wonderful bird, she is now nearly 250 years old, sits on top of my desk, usually humming sailor songs to herself while I write this book. And, as everyone who ever met her knows, Polynesia's memory is the most marvelous memory in the world. If there's any happening I'm not quite sure of, she is always able to put me right, to tell me exactly how it took place, who was there, and everything about it. In fact, sometimes I almost think I ought to say that this book was written by Polynesia instead of me. Very well, then. I will begin. At first... And first, I must tell you something about myself and how I came to meet the doctor. And that was the prologue. So this is part one. Chapter one. The cobbler's son. My name was Tommy Stubbins, son of Jacob Stubbins, the cobbler of Puddleby on the Marsh, and I was nine and a half years old. At that time, Puddleby was only quite a small town. A river ran through the middle of it, and over this river there was a very old stone bridge called King's Bridge which led you from the marketplace on one side to the churchyard on the other. Sailing ships came up this river from the sea and anchored near the bridge. I used to go down and watch the sailors unloading the ships upon the river wall. The sailors sang strange songs as they pulled upon the ropes, and I learned these songs by heart. And I would sit on the river wall with my feet dangling over the water and sing with the men, pretending to myself that I, too, was a sailor. For I longed always to sail away with those brave ships when they turned their backs on Puddleby Church and went creeping down the river again across the wide, lonely marshes to the sea. I longed to go with them out into the world to seek my fortune in foreign lands, Africa, India, China, and Peru. When they got round the bend in the river and the water was hidden from view, you could still see their huge brown sails towering over the roofs of the town, moving onward slowly, like some gentle giants that walked among the houses without noise. What strange things would they have seen, I wondered, when they next came back to anchor at Kingsbridge, and dreaming of the lands I had never seen, I'd sit there, watching till they were out of sight. Three great friends I had in Puddleby in those days. One was Joe, the muscle man, who lived in a tiny hut by the edge of the water under the bridge. This old man was simply marvelous at making things. I never saw a man so clever with his hands. He used to mend my toy ships for me, which I sailed upon the river. He built windmills out of packing cases and barrel staves, and he could make the most wonderful kites from old umbrellas. Joe would sometimes take me in his mussel boat, and when the tide was running out, we would paddle down the river as fast as the edge of the sea to get mussels and lobsters to sell. And out there on the cold, lonely marshes, we would see wild geese flying, and curlews and red shanks, and many other kinds of seabirds that live among the samphire and the long grass of the great salt fen. And as we crept up the river in the evening, when the tide had turned, we would see the lights on Kingsbridge twinkle in the dusk, reminding us of tea time and warm fires. Another friend I had was Matthew Mugg, the cat's meat man. 
He was a funny old person with a bad squint. He looked rather awful, but he was really quite nice to talk to. He knew everybody in Puddleby, and he knew all the dogs and all the cats. In those times, being a cat's meat man was a regular business, and you could see nearly one any day going through the streets with a wooden tray full of pieces of meat. People paid him to give his meat to their cats and dogs instead of feeding them on, a do on dog biscuits or scraps from the table. I enjoyed going around with old Matthew and seeing the cats and dogs come running to the garden gates whenever they heard his call. Sometimes he let me give the meat to the animals myself, and I thought this was great fun. He knew a lot about dogs, and he would tell me the names of the different kinds as we went through the town. He had several dogs of his own. One, a whippet, was a very fast runner, and Matthew used to win prizes with her at the Saturday coursing races. Another dog, a terrier, was a fine ratter. The cat's meat man used to make business of rat catching for the millers and farmers, as well as his other trade of selling cat's meat. Ooh. My third great friend was Luke the Hermit, but of him I will tell you more later on. I did not go to school, because my father was not rich enough to send me. But I was extremely fond of animals, so I used to spend my time collecting bird's eggs and butterflies, fishing in the river, rambling through the countryside after blackberries and mushrooms, and helping the muscle man mend his nests. Yes, it was a very pleasant life I lived in those days long ago, though of course I did not think so then. I was nine and a half years old, and, like all boys, I wanted to grow up, not knowing how well off I was with no cares and nothing to worry me. Always I longed for the time when I should be allowed to leave my father's house, to take passage in one of those brave ships, to sail down the river through the misty marshes to the sea, out onto the world to seek my fortune. That was the end of chapter one. Let's go on to chapter two. I hear of the great naturalist. One early morning in the springtime, when I was wandering among the hills at the back of the town, I happened to come upon a hawk with a squirrel in its claws. It was standing on a rock, and the squirrel was fighting very hard for its life. The hawk was so frightened when I came upon it, suddenly like this, that it dropped the poor creature and flew away. I picked the squirrel up and found that two of its legs were badly hurt. So I carried the squirrel back in my arms to town. When I came to the bridge, I went to the muscle man's hut and asked him if he could do anything for it. Joe put on his spectacles and examined it carefully. Then he shook his head. Your critter's got a broken leg, he said, and another badly cut and all. I can mend you your boats, Tom, but I haven't the tools nor the learning to make a broken squirrel seaworthy. This is a job for a surgeon, and for a right smart one and all. Here, there can be only one man I know who could save yon critter's life, and that's John Doolittle. Who is John Doolittle? I asked. Is he a vet? No, said the muscle man. He's no vet. Dr. Doolittle is a naturalist. What's a naturalist? A naturalist, said Joe, putting away his glasses and starting to fill his pipe, is a man who knows all about animals and butterflies and plants and rocks and all. John Doolittle is a very great naturalist. I'm surprised you never heard of him, and you dapped over animals. He knows a whole lot about shellfish. That I know from my own knowledge. He's a quiet man and doesn't talk much, but there's foes who's Folks who say he's the greatest naturalist in the world. Well, where does he live? Over on the Oxenthorpe Road, to other side of town. Don't just don't know just which house it is, but most anyone cross there could get it. Could tell you, I reckon. Go and see him. He's a great man. So I thanked the muscle man. I took up my squirrel again, and I started off toward the Oxenthorpe Road. The first thing I heard when I came to the marketplace was someone calling meat, meat. There's Matthew Mugg, I said to myself. He'll know where the doctor lives. Matthew knows everyone. I heard he crossed the marketplace and caught him up. Matthew, I said, do you know Dr. Doolittle? Do I know John Doolittle? He said. Well, I should think I do. I know him as well as I know my own wife. Better, I sometimes think. He's a great man. A very great man. Can you show me where he lives? I asked. I want to take the squirrel to him. It has a broken leg. Certainly, said the cat's meat man. I'll be going right by his house directly. Come along and I'll show you. So off we went together. Oh, I've known John Doolittle for years and years, said Matthew as we, as we made our way out of the marketplace. But I'm pretty sure he ain't home now. He's away on voyage. But he's liable to be back any day. I'll show you his house and then you'll know where to find him. All the way down the Oxenthorpe Road, Matthew hardly stopped talking about his great friend, Dr. John Doolittle, M.D. He talked so much that he forgot all about calling out, me, until we were both suddenly noticed that he had a whole procession of dogs following us patiently. 
Where did the doctor go on his voyage? I asked as Matthew handed round the meat to them. I couldn't tell you, he answered. Nobody ever knows where he goes, nor where he's going, nor when he's coming back. He lives all alone except for his pets. He's made some great voyages and some wonderful discoveries. Last time he came back, he told me he'd found a tribe of Indians in the Pacific Ocean. Lived on two islands, they did. The husbands lived on one island and the wives lived on another. They only met once a year when the husbands came over to visit the wives for a great feast. Christmas time, most likely. Yes, he's a wonderful man, is the doctor. And as for animals, well, there ain't no one knows much about him as what he does. How did he get to know so much about animals? I asked. Matthew Mug stopped and leaned down to whisper in my ear. He talks their language, he said in a hoarse, mysterious voice. The animal's language? I cried. Why, certainly, said Matthew. All animals have some kind of language. Some talk more than others. Some only speak in sign language, like deaf and dumb. But the doctor, he understands them all, birds as well as animals. He, we kept it a secret, though, him and me, because folks only laugh at you when you speak of it. Why, he can even write animal language. He reads aloud to his pets. He's wrote history books and monkey talk, poetry and canary language, and comic songs for magpies to sing. That's a fact. He's now busy learning the language of the shellfish. But he says it's hard work, and he has caught some terrible colds holding his head underwater so much. He's a great man. He certainly must be, I said. I do wish he were home so I could meet him. Well, there's his house. Look, said the calf meat man. The little one at the bend in the road there. The one high up, like it was sitting on the wall above the street. We were now come beyond the edge of town, and the house that Matthew pointed out was quite a small one standing by itself. There seemed to be a big garden round it, and this garden was much higher than the road, so you had to go up a flight of steps in the wall before you reached the front gate at the top. I could see that there were many fine fruit trees in the garden, for their branches hung down over the wall in places. But the wall was so high I could not see anything else. When we reached the house, Matthew went up the steps to the front gate, and I followed him. I thought he was going to go into the garden, but the gate was locked. A dog came running down from the house, and he took several pieces of meat, which the cat meets man pushed through the bars of the gate, and some paper bags full of corn and bran. I noticed that this dog did not stop to eat the meat, as any ordinary dog would have done, but he took all the things back to the house and disappeared. He had a curious white collar around his neck, which looked as though it were made of brass or something. Then we came away. The doctor isn't back yet, said Matthew, or the gate wouldn't be locked. What were all those things in paper bags you gave the dog? I asked. Oh, those were provisions, said Matthew. Things for the animals to eat. The doctor's house is simply full of pets. I give the things to the dog while the doctor's away, and the dog gives them to the other animals. And what was that curious collar he was wearing around his neck? That's a solid gold dog collar, said Matthew. It was given to him when he was with the doctor on one of his voyages long ago. He saved a man's life. How long has the doctor had him? I asked. Oh, a long time. Jip's getting pretty old now. That's why the doctor doesn't take him on his voyages anymore. He leaves him behind to take care of the house. Every Monday and Thursday I bring the food to the gate here, and I give it to him through the bars. He never lets anyone come inside the garden while the doctor's away. Not even me, though he knows me well. But you'll always be able to tell if the doctor's back or not, because if he is, the gate will surely be open. So I went off home to my father's house and put my squirrels to bed in an old wooden box full of straw. And there I nursed him myself and took care of him as best I could till the time should come when the doctor would return. And every day I went to the little house with the big garden on the edge of town, and I tried the gate to see if it were locked. Sometimes the dog, Jip, would come down to the gate to meet me. But, though he always wagged his tail and seemed glad to see me, he never let me come inside the garden. And that's the end of chapter two. So we'll stop there. We haven't met the doctor yet, but I'm pretty excited for tomorrow when we're going to meet him in Chapter 3, The Doctor's Home. Thanks for starting this book with me. Pretty excited to read about Dr. Doolittle. And because this is part of our summer reading program, you can get a raffle ticket for listening. So do you have a Read Squirt account? Have you signed up? It's not too late. You can sign up online, and then you can add in this code word that I'm going to tell you. So the code word for today is squirrel. Squirrel because the squirrel got hurt. And the squirrel is what leads him to meet Dr. Doolittle. So type in squirrel, and you'll get a raffle ticket. So thanks for reading with me. I'll see you tomorrow when we meet the doctor. Have a fun day.